come on. Imagine going to every, every day going to work, feeling joyful, engaged, and full of purpose. Imagine having the capacity and the energy to deal with anything that your job threw your way. Imagine having the ability and being empowered to have your work fit into your life and not the other way around. What would become possible for you if that were true? Now imagine that you're the leader that creates this environment for the people around you. You make it possible for your employees to have this sort of working environment. You are the person who supercharges energy, productivity, and engagement within your workplace. All of these things are possible, and I am living proof. However, it didn't start out like this. Five years ago, I was in a point of exhaustion, depression, stress, and burnout. But since that time, I've completely transformed my life and my career, and I've been able to pass it forward to the people around me. And that's what I'd like to tell you about today. Funny thing is, it all starts with a fish. This fish, the Santa Ana sucker. If you're an endangered species biologist in Southern California like I am, this fish is truly special. You see, Santa Ana sucker can withstand most of the threats that come its way. If Santa Ana sucker is in trouble in the environment, if it starts disappearing from the river systems, then you know there's a greater problem with the ecosystem. I've spent most of my career studying species that have been pushed to the brink of extinction because of chronic stressors in their environment. Stressors for this fish include water that's too warm, chemicals in the urban runoff, pharmaceuticals in the, the water supply, and all of these stressors affect their physiology, their body reactions to activities out in the environment. One of the things that happens because these fish are stressed is when they encounter a predator out in the environment, they don't have the capability to react fast enough and they get eaten. Or potentially, they don't have enough energy resources within their bodies because they've used them up on survival that they can't reproduce effectively, and therefore you start to see population declines. So let me put this in context. Effects to individuals from chronic stressors has a long-term effect on the population. We'll come back to that in a minute. So you're probably thinking, Heather, this is a very interesting biology lesson, but what does it have to do with leadership? So I'll go back to the low point of my life. Five or six years ago, I was dealing with my own chronic stressors. I was dealing with the unexpected death of my father, taking care of my grandmother with dementia, raising a small son, trying to balance the demands of a home life and work. So I made the logical conclusion that this was the perfect time to go back to graduate school. And I enrolled in an executive MBA program here at Claremont Graduate University. But what I didn't realize was that this decision would change the whole trajectory of my life. It led me to the classroom of Dr. Jeremy Hunter in a class called The Executive Mind. And I remember sitting in this classroom one evening and hearing Jeremy talk about the red zone or the place where your body is constantly under attack from these stress hormones. Your body is having a fight or flight reaction to chronic stress in your environment. And although this is an excellent adaptation for humans to survive millennia, think escape from a bear, great thing to have an adrenaline response, you can't live there. If you live in the red zone, there will be consequences. And that's where I was. I was at the point where I had no energy, no ability to adapt. I was at a point where I was near emotional, physical, and mental collapse. 
But what I also learned in this class was that there were ways that we could deal with it. And I felt hope. I learned the tools to get myself out of the red zone. Now, we've all heard stories about people who decide they're going to take better care of themselves, and I'm sure you can imagine what this looks like. I started sleeping more, eating better, making sure I had time for exercise, but I did even harder things, like asking for help, like starting therapy for the first time in my life and learning how to let go of resentment and anger. And as I did those things and I made those changes, I really started to feel more capacity to deal with things in my life. I had better mental energy. I had more happiness. I had a better outlook and I became more effective in my life. Just like the Santa Ana sucker that starts swimming in cooler, cleaner water, I had the ability to deal with the things that life throws at you. I was living in a more sustainable way. What I didn't realize in that journey was it was just the beginning, actually. And about three months after I finished graduate school, a job opened up in my organization, not the next level above me, a few levels above me, at the very top of my organization. And before my revitalization or my transformation, I never would have even dreamed about going for that job. But I had been on this epic journey of understanding and transformation, and I now had the motivation, I had the energy, I had the capability, and the confidence to go for it. So I applied. Lots of people didn't agree that I could do this job. I was a project manager and a biologist. But I knew I could do it. And even more so, I knew that some of the changes that I had made in my own life had actually been hindered and stopped by the old mindsets within my organization. And so I knew that we needed to have this transformational change of our organizational culture, because I wasn't the only one suffering from these things. And so I realized that the only way that we were ever going to have that type of transformational change was if I let it. So I became the CEO, and I decided to change things up. In this new role as the CEO, I realized that I was no longer a single fish swimming in the single river, worrying about my own threats coming my way. I realized that in this new position, I was looking down on an entire system that was facing extreme hardships, extreme challenges. Water scarcity is one of the hardest problems to solve. And I realized that in this era of extreme scarcity and really uh, devastating threats, not just to one species, but to all species, that our old leadership models, they just didn't apply. I realized that I needed to change the organizational culture so that I could allow our employees to have the same sort of transformation, that they could also increase their capacity. I was working with about 33 uh, very capable, dedicated professionals, but they were warriors trying to make sure that millions of people had a reliable water supply during a mega drought. So at that point, I realized, wow, we need to get into green zone organizational culture. The vitality zone, as Jeremy sometimes calls it, it's this place where people feel energized, where they feel capable of taking things on, where they feel relaxed, but also engaged with the mission. The ideal organizational culture is where people want to go to work and give it 100% every single day because they're so engaged with the purpose, the reason why they're there and the good impacts they can have in the world that they're willing to work from anywhere, at any time, they just want to get the job done. This green zone organizational transformation that I was working on really became a passion 
And it took a lot of courage to say to my board, who I report to, we need to do things differently. So how do you implement this sort of organizational transformation? Well, the first thing you do, the first thing that I did, is I had meaningful human connection with the people that worked there, and I authentically appreciated that people were our most important and valuable asset. And the way that you do that is you do it through actions, not just words. So I sat down with every single employee and learned about what was going on in their life. What were their challenges? What were their dreams? What was happening in their children's lives and their parents' lives? Many of us in leadership have employees who are taking care of not just their kids, but sometimes their grandkids and their parents all at the same time. It's amazing. Finding out what they were going through on a daily basis allowed me to better support them. The other thing that I learned, and I try to implement with all of our leaders, is that you have to check your ego at the door. If you want this type of environment, this green zone environment, it's not about us. We as the leaders are not the most important person in the room. We might be the face of the organization, but it's really about the work and the people who do it. Control and micromanagement is an ego-driven behavior that is not successful long-term. You can try it, but you're probably not gonna have the high performers for very long. So what do I do differently? I give the staff the purpose, I empower them, and I let them go. Purpose, empowerment, and autonomy is what drives our workforce and we get better results because of it. One thing that I have learned over this few years, three years now of being the CEO, is that if you get the right people in the right spots and you have them driven by this purpose, this greater good that makes them want to be there, the results will just be astounding. How do I know that this somewhat untraditional, at least in public uh, utilities, approach to leadership and organizations is working? I tell my people, do your job. Be there for your team. Figure out how to make your job work within your life. And they do it. We are more productive than we have ever been. Our staff is 35 employees. We're building two multi-million dollar major water infrastructure projects right now. We just secured 400 million more dollars, not just for ourselves, but for the entire region so that we can build 27 new water supply projects. But to take it to a more personal level, I wanna share with you some of the other things that are happening. We just won a top workplace award solely based on, environment, on the culture of the organization and employee satisfaction. I have long-term employees who are actually delaying retirement because they're having so much fun in their job doing the work. I regularly have people from other agencies coming and approaching me saying, I'd really love to finish out my career with you. This one I'm really proud of. Since I became CEO, we've had four people enter into higher education, everything from getting their AA degree to PhDs, and we've had two people already graduate. None of that is possible without this green zone organizational culture. We've set up a system where people have the capacity, the energy, and the support structure they need to achieve really great things. In this era of really hard challenges, again, water scarcity, saving endangered species, dealing with climate crises, all of these things require a leader who is willing to ask for help and work together. I believe that the era of the big ego is over. There's still big egos out there, but they're not the ones to lead us. Before I leave you, I wanna pass along one more biology lesson that I think is important to leadership. 
So most people think about the term survival of the fittest as being a physical competition. Whoever's the strongest, whoever's the tallest, they have the flashiest tail feathers, they win. But you can also survive by having the best behaviors, the most successful behaviors. And then you pass those behaviors on to the next generation. So I think we have an opportunity now with organizational behavior to do the same thing. If we as the leaders can demonstrate to our organizations that we have found a better way to do business, if we are more successful, if we have found advantageous ways to secure and keep the highest performers, if we can show that we are more successful with these strategies and we pass it on to the next generation, then we have an opportunity to affect real change in this world. I like to think that my role here now is to pass on this positive leadership philosophy. And so my goal is that we have sort of an organizational evolution, that we make sure that as the leaders, we instill in everyone that if we take care of ourselves, if we take care of each other, if we find ways to build in resilience into our organizations and we pass that on to the next generation, then that's how we're really going to change the world. Thank you.